Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Stantec Water webinar series. It's our pleasure to introduce Sandeep Sathya Murthy as our presenter today. He will discuss the new ISO standard and implications for energy assessments, as well as the complexity of operations and implications for instrumentation and management. I am Heather Dean, your hostess. During this meeting, you will be in listen-only mode. We invite you to submit questions at any time during the presentation. If you're joining via computer or your mobile device, you can do so by selecting the Q&A icon in the top panel of your screen. Your questions will be addressed following the presentation. And with that, Sandeep, I will pass it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, good day, uh, whatever you are. Hope you don't mind. I'm going to turn my camera off uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, bandwidth, you know, particularly for the interest of those joining on a phone. So again, you know, Heather, thank you for the intro. I'm very much looking forward to uh, sharing on the topic of balancing nutrient removal uh, with energy management and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Both. Uh, this is a very important topic for our industry as we look to uh, make more sustainable systems. Uh, and certainly for me per, per, uh, personally as well, you know, I think this is something uh, I have spent uh, a fair bit of energy and time on over the last decade or so, and one that I think enables us to make an impact for uh, our clients and colleagues. Just a, a quick uh, before we start, uh, just a brief uh, thought, you know, one of our, our key Stantec moments here in, in recent years around the use of AI. Um, I won't, just wanted to share uh, a few things. Uh, artificial intelligence, AI is certainly becoming something that we're all getting increasingly exposed to, both in our day-to-day -day lives outside of work, as well as using it at work as well. And you know, some key things I think we should all be uh, keeping in mind, if you don't mind. First um, are the inherent potential biases in the AI outputs themselves. Uh, we've seen this play out in a range of ar arenas recently, of course, and you know this outcome really stems from the fact that AI models are a very strong function of what data and inputs are used to train the model. So, of course, we should be using this. It's a valuable tool that aids us and supports us. But you know, please um, be aware and and apply reason and logic to 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 assess the outputs themselves before. Uh, you know, gaining much confidence in uh, whatever you're using it for. Um, of the other things noted here, I just wanted to highlight the environmental impacts aspect, uh, both the energy and water footprint for the use of AI is exceptionally high. Um, I suspect uh, many have tracked in the news recently that uh, Microsoft, among others, is really focused on what is their energy availability and the same is true for water, um, where you know using chat GPT uh, exerts a pretty significant impact on the engineered water system. So of course, again here it's um, you know please do use AI; it's valuable, but you know use it judiciously and uh, perhaps with particular attention to the type of questions and queries and the value of those um, in the use cases themselves. So on with the show, uh, really excited about this. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to focus today on this interplay between uh, these three core areas, uh, nutrient management, uh, the related energy footprint of removing these nutrients from wastewater um, and the resulting uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how that impacts um, our overall sustainability profiles. Following a brief background, um, I'll use a case study, in fact, to, to illustrate how these three linked elements impact decision making when it comes to BNR upgrades. Um, I'd like to, in, to introduce the International Standards Organization's uh, new um, energy benchmarking. It's uh, re uh, relatively new, 21939. Um, and finally, I'd like to discuss some innovative technologies that, again, the, the the essence will be how do they fit within the context of these three uh, linked priorities for us. Maybe the place to start, you know, for me is just acknowledging that this technology of biological nutrient removal has really had a significant impact, a positive impact 
on many receiving streams across the globe, from uh, the barrier in uh, San Francisco, where I am, to the Long Island Sound and Ch uh, Chesapeake Bay, BNR technologies have really been central to enhancing the quality of these important recreational gems, I'll call them. While in Singapore, um, BNR is a critical element in expanding end use opportunities for effluent to include portable reuse. Uh, portable reuse in Singapore is existentially important for their, their uh, continued pro uh, prosperity and you know, certainly advanced water pur uh, purification is the heart of making this happen at the back end. But I would maybe argue that um, BNR well, perhaps is not the heart, but it is certainly the continuously functioning lungs that work at peak performance as, as much as po possible and supports our ability to uh, to promote and, and further support portable reuse and sustain our increasing global thirst for safe drinking water. When we start to look at, you know, what does what has nutrient removal looked at over the look like over the last 20 years or so? Um, one, we see a greater emphasis on the removal of total nitrogen um, sh uh, sh shown here. Oh, excuse me, sh uh, shown here in the gray bars. I apologize for my um, le uh, my legends being backwards um, and increasingly stringent requirements. If we look back only to uh, only 20 years or so in the in the in aughts, you're going to see that um, it would likely have been, you know, relatively easy to get uh, an ammonia target of about 15 to 20, let's say, milligram and per liter. However, more recently, it's not atypical, even for smaller communities, to have a total nitrogen target or limit under 10 milligram and per liter. And if we look ahead, this trend uh, appears to only continue to be more and more stringent, and you know, focused on what what um, what and focuses us on what technologies are needed to meet these very stringent limits. So what does this mean? What are the impacts of this? Well, for starters, the resulting greenhouse gas emissions from biological nutrient removal will continue to increase. Today, uh, 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 water resource recovery facilities are responsible for about 5% of the global non carbon dioxide emissions, and this is certainly pro uh, projected to increase. And the vast majority of that is a result of scope one or direct emissions from the process itself. Another quite significant impact, of course, is the energy consumption. Most of this is uh, related to the biological process and aeration in particular. You know, certainly this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, excludes uh, pumping energy where, where that's a very big factor. This is quite typical for many systems. This in particular is for uh, a, 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 it's about a 10 MGD facility. So when we put these pieces together, the need to get to more stringent limits, the you know increasing and high greenhouse gas emissions and the high energy costs, particularly in, in markets where in, the price of energy keeps increasing, it really does explain the effort being expended by both academics and practitioners alike looking for innovative solutions or even incremental uh, opportunities to maintain and enhance our ability to remove nutrients while reducing energy footprint and greenhouse gas emissions from the BNR process. I think it's worth taking a moment since we're you know talking about these the ideas, uh, the effluent quality and op opportunities, sustainability and energy to think about, OK, where, you know, how does the energy profile of a facility change if I transition from primary treatment only, so no biological processes, to BOD removal? That obviously comes at a very significant energy cost. And then as you transition from BOD removal to nitrification, just the removal of ammonia, um, that could almost double the the uh, the energy footprint. Certainly, you know, uh, targeting a total nitrogen uh, limit could have some value from an energy perspective because of the oxygen credits resulting from denitrification. 
while these are you know good <clears throat> values to 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 think about in a general sense i think it's really important as we look into the future to have something quantitative to benchmark where one is now and then evolve and have that be you know something universal though that that we can all apply so some type of a of a benchmark there are certainly many approaches to doing this uh, you know some have been used for uh, several years now and one that I, I would offer has some value for us as an industry to think about standardizing on is the ISO 21939 it's um, fairly recent. It was uh, uh, put into in uh, put in. It was accepted by the committee in 2019, and really, you know, shown in the in the table here, offers a quantitative and um, dashboard view of uh, what the energy consumption is. So it's a measurement of the net energy consumption which is really a ratio, and I'll show you in a moment. Uh, I promise you it'll be the only formula in the presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a measure of the energy consumption in a biological nutrient removal process relative to the total amount of oxidizable pollutants in, uh, removed in the system. What this really offers, I think, is a a benchmark not only for comparison, but a scaffold for continuous improvement as one evolves a facility. I was here at one. I've now improved to 0.5. I can further improve to this if I do these things. And what value is that going to gain me? So just in brief, the net energy consumption shown here as NEC is the ratio of the total energy consumed linked with blowers, pumping of RAS and Imler and, and other pumps, and the mixing energy. Uh, ratio to um, the, the net oxidizable mass removed, uh, both COD and nitrogen, uh, nitrogen uh, species. So we've talked a little bit now about the energy consumption associated with nutrient removal, nitrogen removal in uh, particular. Um, and I've you know talking about nitrification, denitrification. So I, you know I think it is worth now diving a little bit into um, into the processes of nitrogen removal, so we can see what can we optimize, what opportunities are av are available. So here's um, a version of um, the nitrogen cycling diagram that we're often exposed to in in papers and at at conferences at the start of a presentation around um, nitrification, nitrotation, nitritation, deammonification, and more recently in the vernacular partial uh, uh, denitrification. Certainly very insightful, very va valuable way to think about the states of nitrogen. However, I would offer that maybe this is of limited value when we're thinking about a systems analysis perspective. So it may be more useful for us to you know, think about these in terms of what inputs are there into the system? What assets do we have available? What controllable things can we make changes on? In essence, what knobs can we turn? And what, are, what is and are, are the result of these things from an outcomes perspective? We are focused, of course, on emissions, what opportunities, so effluent quality, what opportunities um, have I generated as a result of doing X, Y, or Z, and the energy consumption itself. So I want to dig into this a little bit again, taking a systems view of uh, what we have and say, OK, if I look at the knobs I can turn, the dials I can play with, turn the volume up, if you will, or down, as needed. Uh, I can control airflow. I can control the WAS rate, which in effect would control the solids retention time. Um, and I, I can also control um, the ammonia and DO concentration in an aerobic environment itself using these knobs. You know, I, <clears throat> I've noted this here that I see the influent or uh, primary effluent, something coming into the biological process as not a controllable, but a somewhat predictable element. And maybe as a little bit of a 
teaser in the months to come with with uh, some of my colleagues will be doing a, a, a webinar on machine learning and AI applications in our industry and where they really fit. And you know we're finding more and more that we we can to some extent predict the quality of what's coming in and use that to then control proactively, predictively control systems. That's why I'm calling this a little bit of a predictable element. So I'd like to think about now, if I turn one of these knobs, if I turn Airflow or WAS, what is going to happen? And I'll I'll focus on Airflow, right? If I control Airflow, the outcome from that control is the oxygen concentration in the reactor. And again, um, you know, thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, a, knob, a dial, uh, I can go high, I can go low. And so, I think DO is particularly interesting um, if we if we try to see what would happen to the dissolved oxygen concentration um, as I take um, as I take the dissolved oxygen from excuse me what what would happen to the performance of the asset in the asset as I take the dissolved oxygen concentration from low to high and back and forth and so on. DO is an in interesting one to focus on because of the seeming tug of war, you know, as, as, as we can see here, there is uh, what I'm showing here uh, on the Y axis is the biomass specific growth rate. On the X axis is the dissolved oxygen concentration in an aerobic system. And this is shown both for nitrifying bacteria in the blue with the hat with the, the uh, left to right uh, hatches and for hetero trophic bacteria or denitrifying bacteria in the right to left uh, embedded within the red, um, red, the two red lines. And so Theo is an interesting one to think about because here we see this uh, tug of war, right? Uh, as I increase, I turn that knob, as I turn the dial uh, from low to high, blue is getting higher and higher and higher, red is getting lower and lower and lower. Um, so generally what we can surmise from a plot like this is that as I increase the DO, the growth rate, and therefore performance maybe, of ammonia oxidizers gets better, and that of denitrifiers tends to get worse. So somewhat old news here, I recognize that, but I think it's worth drilling down into this just a little bit more. So I'm going to look at one early part of this very low DO concentration, so one you'd find in an anoxic reactor. Conventional thinking, of course, uh, suggests that no nitrification would occur here. But you know what this is sh showing with a, a pretty wide uncertainty band. However, there, there is the possibility that some ammonia um, oxidizers may grow. And you know how can we take advantage of that? We don't really know exactly yet, but we know that something might be happening. However, it is fair to say that at this low DO condition, anoxic condition, it strongly favors denitrifiers. How about if I turn that dial now, increase the DO just a little bit more? So this becomes a little more interesting now, where what, what we're seeing in essence is that in this, let's say half to one uh, dissolved oxygen level, um, we're seeing that the biomass specific growth rates of these two competing, in a way, um, elements, the two, two bacteria who are competing, uh, appears to be comparable. So the biomass specific growth rate of denitrifiers and nitrifiers at this fairly low dissolved oxygen level is comparable. However, when you translate this to performance, nitrifiers are particularly not very, um, uh, highly functional because of the lower concentration of those bacteria in the reactor at these conditions. So potentially, looking ahead, potentially if we were to increase their concentration in some other way, we could expect nitrification performance to be pretty good, even at these very low DO levels, which are conventionally not associated with, with the uh, nitrifiers. As we continue to turn that dial up, right? Now we're going in that one to two, two and a half ish uh, milligram per liter DO range, where uh, many wastewater 
tr uh, treatment plant biological systems are operated. Um, you know, certainly we see that the denitrifiers, their, their performance continues to decline somewhat, and nitrifier performance continues to increase. But uh, what I'd maybe ask you to think about is that going from around one to around two milligram per liter, um, it's about less than a, looking at the mean values here, if you will, less than a 20% increase in the biomass specific uh, growth rate. So does it warrant a little bit of assessment around, is that increase worth it? Should I be paying for it? Is my asset performance dramatically increasing as a result of this incremental uh, performance change, but quite significant aeration uh, impact? And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But now what I'll do is I'll turn that dial up even more. I'll go all the way up to four milligram per liter. Right. And now we see this and say, OK, uh, I can get another 20 percent, let's just say a 20 percent increase in biomass specific growth rate. However, this comes at you know 30 percent or more uh, increase in aeration energy consumption. These sorts of things have to be part of our decision making pro uh, process around. Is this worth it? Do I need that flexibility or? Can I find the optimum balance between being wanting to be sustainable, uh, you know, wanting to lower my energy costs and still uh, having enough flexibility to meet my end use opportunity or re regulatory target? So now I think what we can do is, you know, think about this dial being turned and how does it impact decision making using these three um, key 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 uh, concepts that we've been talking about. Um, so I want to manage nutrients, which means that I'm, I want to look at my effluent quality. I want to manage sustainability. I can look at my greenhouse gas emissions and I want to manage energy. And here I'll focus on the net energy consumption. Of course, I also want to know what my costs are and what my operating costs are as well. And I want them to be low, lower or if we think about this black line, the horizontal black line is the existing baseline. I want them to be at or below for each and every one of these metrics. So I'll share um, a case study where um, you know with, I've thought about this in the past with a utility, and the utility was um, it's about a, a 20 mgd or 76 mld plant. Uh, and they were looking and evaluating options for uh, a future uh, quite stringent re uh, total nitrogen, a total inorganic nitrogen li uh, li uh, li uh, limit. Um, it's got th three trains and uh, currently successfully achieves nitrification. C kind of the big goals of the study were to evaluate a baseline for operation in the future. Uh, continuing in the current mode of operation, you know, sort of a, uh, a business as usual str a strategy, and then um, evaluate how far away would that be from the future targets, effluent targets, and subsequently assess opportunities which could then meet the future limits, focusing on these three elements, the effluent quality, energy, and, uh, and a greenhouse gas emissions, and also thinking about uh, process and system stability and costs. So we applied a three-tier str uh, strategy, if you will. First, let's see if we can make some optimizations, small, small incremental ch uh, 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 changes at relatively low cost and low impact on ongoing operations to meet the future targets. Uh, I might offer that we think about this as an inframaxing a strategy, so maximizing the value of your existing infrastructure. And if that doesn't work, what, what can we do in the other tiers itself? There's no dearth of optimization um, options. Um, my team really focused on, on a couple. Um, enhanced aeration control, which is a reasonably well-established, uh, let's say, mature technology. Um, and hydrocyclones, which are now gaining gr uh, ground in the marketplace. 
I will focus on um, the enhanced aeration control results. And you know these two rose to the top because of, uh, again, s simplicity of implementation. There were a number of others we considered early on in the assessment. So I'll come back to this idea of turning the knobs. I, I, you know, it, it, it um, resonates with me, especially as we're thinking about optimization of assets. So turning the knobs at our disposal, what do we have? What can we do? Um, certainly turning the aeration knob, you know, um, I'm going to show some, some uh, results here. So we looked at uh, a number of different scenarios, and what you're seeing here is a, a summary of the results. Top panel is a comparison of the net energy consumption, and the bottom uh, panel is, is a comparison of the dry weather discharge soluble total inorganic uh, uh, nitrogen loads, uh, just for the sake of, of completeness. Uh, soluble total inorganic nitrogen is basically ammonia plus nitrite plus nitrate. Um, what we see is indeed, um, if we go to a tapered DO and maybe add an anoxic zone, uh, we can reduce the, uh, the net energy consumption quite significantly. Both options would do that. Um, however, it's interesting to see that adding that anoxic zone adds another about 9-10% uh, reduction in the NEC, right? Um, and both of them very easily meet what the future uh, our targets are. So relatively simple. There are minimal modifications to the aeration piping, actually upgrading what, what airflow control valves, what air control valves are there to just add uh, uh, motor operators, um, new FRP baffle to create an anoxic zone, relatively inexpensive mixing in that zone, some new DO sensors, um, and you know you can get you can get to this outcome. Right? Um, I will just highlight a little bit this idea that new a new there new new operators for the flow control valves uh, because I want to talk about um, some of the detail things. Now I'm switching a little bit and thinking about a, uh, a different case study because in the one I was just showing you, the valves worked fine. There were no, no issues with them. But shown here on the left is a butterfly valve uh, performance curve from another pro uh, project where I was actually the reviewer. The, the utility had asked you know very similar questions uh, uh, questions that I just described above, and the intent was to use as much of the existing infrastructure as possible. Right. Um, the result uh, was that hey, you know, yes, this can be reused. However, when we did some more detailed analysis of you know how, where would the valve be operating, we re we realized that at the dry weather and you know min and low flow conditions the valve would really be in this non nonlinear range where small changes in valve position would result in quite large changes in the performance of the system. So we anticipated it would be continuously hunting and looking for position. And the outcome would be that the blow that you need a lot of air blow offs to maintain you know, where, where you were in operation. Would that negate any of the energy value, energy uh, uh, benefits? This is something that we 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 did then have changed with the with the utility. On the right, I'm just showing a a pretty typical example of um, a transition from an anoxic to an aerobic zone. And here, I just want to emphasize that when we go through these exercises of assessing in a model or or you know through experimentation, what the value of these these upgrades might be, we cannot forget about hydraulics. Hydraulics are critically important um, because at the front of an aerobic zone, across, but especially at the front where there's a fair bit of air, there's an airlift. That airlift creates some back mixing, if you will, of oxygen. Uh, and that airlift could add as much as two to two and a half, uh, half inches uh, in the hydraulic pro uh, profile. The good thing is it can be calculated, uh, it can be assessed, and then integrated into your, your upgrade and design analysis. So 
just returning back to the the case uh, study that we were looking at, indeed, um, you know these inframaxing improvements, uh, the proposed strategy does indeed meet uh, the objectives. Bit increase in cost, of course, compared to the the do nothing, uh, not that much. Um, and one of the things that we noted is that um, you know th there is an increase in FTEs primarily related to management of new instruments. So this this worked um, and we they moved, they've now moved forward with this upgrade. So even though the case uh, study met the objectives with the optimization piece, um, I'd like to maybe ask the question, what if it had not? So I want to introduce, um, you know, uh, if if it had not, um, what path would we have gone along? So now we'll think about, well, what more significant modifications can we make um, using what's there, uh, addition of some mi mi uh, minimal new technologies uh, before we think about a wholesale upgrade? Again, there's no dearth. We are really in this age of innovation where there are so many potential technologies that can be used, and I'm showing them here again from going right, are mature and established ones on the far left, and then going to you know more early stage uh, 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 testing technologies. And the one that I'm really going to focus on and and highlight because um, I think it's quite interesting to to think about is actually working your way upstream and thinking about how perhaps high rate primary tr uh, treatment can influence positively and otherwise um, what's downstream and how might that play into an upgrade strategy and thinking. So I'll come back to our example. Um, you know, okay, now we have this FRP. Anoxic zones, some mixing, some enhancements, and it's working pr pretty well, right? Of course, in the biological process, our goal is to focus on nitrogen and phosphorus removal, and um, you know, soluble COD being used uh, to support it, and of course, it'll, it'll make its way through. But we really want the particulate COD and as much of the colloidal as we can, uh, perhaps leaving the system um, in through the primary sludge for example. So enter primary filtration. This is uh, one uh, potential option for high rate primary treatment. There are um, a handful of installations across the, uh, the country and more in design at the moment. It's a technology that has a smaller footprint certainly than conventional primary clarifiers and Produces an effluent with lower total solid, uh, total suspended solids and colloidal COD. Note, however, um, you know it's, it's 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 important to keep the um, the other aspects in mind, which is that there's more the quantity of sludge produced is higher, and it's a thinner sludge. So there's some key things that we need to be thinking about. How might this influence what's downstream? It's so looking at this in a slightly different view saying okay the effluent quality i think these are benefits of course because if i can lower these um i can have a higher um, vs to ts ratio i can reduce the air requirements for bod removal you know potentially use only the soluble carbon to drive um nutrient removal if i can lower my c to n ratio does that open me up for more opportunities related to a novel uh, shortcut N processes and so on. But we do need to really consider the, the impacts on the primary sludge. How does that affect downstream biosolids handling processes? I want to dig a little bit into this idea of you know, the COD removal. So I'm showing here um, some data from an influent. So it's fairly typical for domestic wa uh, wa uh, wastewater, a lot of particulate COD and some soluble and colloidal COD. Once this passes through the, the primary filtration pro uh, pro uh, process, 
um, what you have is obviously a substantial decrease in the particulate COD, some decrease in the colloidal and none or all, almost none we'll say, in the soluble COD. Certainly this will reduce the aeration requirements for BOD COD removal downstream, but it's very interesting to you know, think about what other impacts might this have. And some, it took us a while to, to re really understand this over the last few, a few years, but it then started to make sense. I wanted to share this because I think it's, it's extremely exciting. So one of the interesting um, positive impacts of removing all that is a reduction in the oxygen uptake rate uh, in the biological process itself. This will in turn reduce the aeration demand because of the less amount of um, COD to be oxidized, but also interestingly, due to a reduction in the mass transfer resistance for oxygen into the flock, or to put another way, an increase in alpha. Alpha is directly linked to oxygen uptake and the mixed liquor concentration in the process itself. By reducing this uh, COD going down, reducing the uptake rate, it in turn reduces the blower uh, requirements. In the front of a basin with a conventional primary effluent, you may have an uptake rate, let's say you know, 80, 90 milligram per liter per hour. And so if you could get a 10% reduction or a 5% reduction. Let, let, uh, let's take 10% as, uh, as a number we could target and potentially see. You could get a 25% reduction in blower energy requirements. So by implementing high rate primary treatment upfront, not only are you going to have you know, better primary effluent quality, but you also have this positive impact on alpha, which in turn will reduce the energy consumption and increase the overall uh, sustainability of the system. So often we can re we, we really focus on improving an asset in the asset itself, but you know taking a holistic view of it is very valuable because if we can work our way upstream, perhaps we can have this massive downstream effect that we had not really thought about because of some of the newer technologies in the market at, uh, at, uh, today. So again, just continuing down the, or up, I should say, the, the tiered approach where let's say neither optimizations worked nor these more significant uh, upgrades would have worked, then of course, we well, we might have to consider wholesale technology upgrade. Again, there's absolutely no dearth of technologies in the market today. Uh, many are well tried, well, well tested, and some of the more recent ones, AGS, for example, um, uh, aerobic granular sludge, mobile media, encapsulated bi uh, bi uh, bi uh, uh, biomass, and perhaps some would argue this is a little optimistic, that I've put anaerobic MBRs in this emerging uh, category. Maybe they should be further on the right because um, I've, I've uh, uh, really put them in parallel with partial denitrification, uh, and maybe that's not you know I, I'm I'm trying to be opponent of anaerobic pro uh, processes, and I'm I keep being optimistic that we will we will crack the code, if you will. Right. So if I look at this from left to right, these are really, um, you know, they're on uh, on they're on cable. They're the movies that we've you know seen numerous times. And I would say the stuff right of center is coming to a screen near you at some point soon. So I want to take this, you know, uh, bevy of technologies and try to organize them on, you know, coming back to the the three key elements that we're thinking about, effluent quality, sustainability, and energy, right? This is really what, what um, I just want to, you know, emphasize a little bit more. And when we try to organize this, I would say in terms of effluent quality, one can meet a target effluent quality with, with, with any and all of these. They are very 
high value. There are certainly you know some some limitations and a ban, but generally speaking, the configuration is much more, I will say, uh, impactful than the technology itself. Well, the greenhouse gas emissions and sustainability and energy, it's all linked, of course. Um, you know, some of those that have a lot of plastics involved in the technology or require lots of energy, maybe, uh, you know, have exert a very high energy footprint. Um, so would be a little bit lower on their value proposition, whereas some ones being explored now by the community of pra pra uh, practice around partial uh, uh, denitrification and maybe uh, PN as well, um, you know, have some very high value opportunities. Just a quick note, um, without uh, delving into the details, I'm 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 happy to do that in the Q and A, but. Perhaps something to be thinking about as one works on upgrades. Think about that next piece of the of the puzzle. What if I wanted to um, to um, implement partial denitrification Animox today? What do I have to do? Recognizing that um, this technology is maybe not entirely ready for you know full prime time use and may not be applicable to every single type of wastewater either. But if it were, and if it were ready at this point, what does that configuration look like? Can we set up systems to prepare us for tomorrow? I think this is a really important way to you know, think about our upgrades. I want to close just with uh, a couple of thoughts, if you don't mind. You know, we've been focusing on this trifecta, if you will, of uh, nutrient management, so effluent quality, uh, greenhouse gas emissions or sustainability impacts, and then, uh, you know, using uh, net energy consumption as a surrogate to think about energy management strategies. I think with, um, in the widespread technology that's available today and that you know the fu the future is, it holds uh, very promising pathways forward really i would offer that we all need to be thinking about an integrated resource management strategy and suite of solutions as we uh, upgrade our systems and we will continue to have these increasingly stringent targets and i think if we look at this the system as a whole it will really enable us to unlock more value from our assets. Whether this means moving towards um, more modular systems, uh, multiple technologies, all, all of this may be possible. Certainly, it, it adds a degree of operational complexity that needs to be assessed in parallel as well. The last thought that I, I'm, I might leave you with is that getting to this integrated resource management state really does warrant and mandate a Kaizen man's mindset. So continuous improvement really has to be the, the theme and the model in which we we operate. So if we take energy um, as one as the knob that we the big knob that we want to turn, well, you do the be the benchmarking, well, which we, we showed how to do that a little bit. You focus on the demand side, um, which are the energy consuming pro uh, processes and how can I optimize them? Well, we, we showed that a little bit, but then you can also focus on the supply side. Can I change my mix? C can I add in you know, other approaches to provide energy which are either cheaper, more stable, more sustainable? And what we cannot forget is this need and, and importance of building capacity in our teams to continue uh, getting the best value from all of these processes. And then you repeat that again and again. And rather than you know doing this on a 20 year cycle or a 25 year cycle, I think this has to be a, a real mandate for our utilities for a continuous improvement mindset around, um, you know, uh, uh, akin to maybe what um, the, the transition from industry 2.0 to 3.0 to 4.0 is really been about. The data that we have available now, uh, coupled with a, 
a lot of the new data capture, you know, sensors, et cetera, et cetera, technologies, I think will only scaffold this in a very strong way and enable us to, you know, move forward, designing, operating, uh, managing assets, which holistically meet this goal of um, high end use opportunities, high number, high quality, sustainable, as well as energy efficient. Thank you so much for the time. I'm very happy to uh, answer questions that we have. Um, and if, um, yeah, that's it. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Sandeep, for sharing the Thanks, latest Sandeep. methods and technologies aimed at balancing targeted energy and greenhouse gas re reductions while complying with more stringent nutrient removal standards. There is a lot of great information there. Uh, we have a number of good questions here already, so I encourage you, our listeners, to keep those questions coming by typing those again in the Q&A drop-down window at the top of your screen. First question in for you, Sandeep. In your experience, are nitrogen probes a useful tool? So mm. such as ammonia, nitrogen, dioxide, and nitrous oxide. Yeah. Um, let me start with ammonia probes. I think they are a very useful um, part of a tool set. However, you really have to be careful about where in your process they're being used and, and how, and the management of those probes itself. Some of the research I've done in the past uh, suggests that if they're continuously used in very low ammonia environments, they in quotes, they fall asleep and they're very hard to uh, revive again. We also find that um, you really have to think about an instrument management plan, which includes both calibration and validation, because um, often if you only do a calibration step you, you step, you may over calibrate. But if you have um, a calibration validation step, you can effectively manage these to get you know, high quality data into your control system. Uh, there were some other aspects there like uh, N2O probes and so on. N2O is a great uh, probe. The technology keeps evolving. I think it's it's getting better and better. Um, yeah, that's that's where we, we are with that. The nitride probe, I think, is a tricky one. We haven't quite broken it from, uh, haven't quite cracked that from my uh, perspective. Um, Research experiences I've had uh, suggest a fair bit of interference between nitrite measurement online and and oxygen and so on, particularly because we are dealing with very low nitrite concentrations in quite uh, complex environments. So maybe the the punchline of all that is yes, they're useful, but buyer beware uh, where you're using them and how you're you're using. Them. Thank you, Cindy. In your presented case study, what was the payback period in power costs for installing the baffle? Oh, great, um, great question. Uh, I think it was between eight and eleven years, depending on you know how you think about it. Perhaps I would offer um, thinking about payback in situations like this. I, I would say it pays back from day one because uh, whatever you're going to operate at, you can now operate in a more energy efficient mode. So yes, this baffle, the mixers, the upgrades to the valves, et cetera, it will be eight or 10 years before you pay it back. But what is the alternative? If you don't do it, you will you will continue to pay what, what you were paying before. So particularly when it comes to public infrastructure i think we we may maybe i would offer we need to rethink this idea of um you know payback period if you will but it was in the eight to eleven year range anyway Great, any suggestions on managing the primary filter sludge being thinner than conventional primary clarifier sludge yeah i mean you know right now uh mechanical thickening is a compact uh, option to accomplish that. Uh, but of course, that comes with some uh, more kit, more technology. Um, another way is to revert back to you know conventional uh, 
uh, gravity thickening and potentially using that as a dual purpose um, gravity th uh, gravity thickener fermenter generating some uh, in-plant biodegradable carbon which can then be used in different places thinking about an overall you know carbon management strategy as part of your sustainability uh, planning and and program with that continuous improvement uh, Kaizen um, uh, mindset. So mechanical or gravity um, are the two options which uh, appear to be favorable at the moment. Is the ideal energy intensity ratio a useful tracking tool? And over Great what question. Yeah. should, yeah, and over, it's a two-part question, sorry, Sandy. Oh, it's a two-part question. Okay. Over what period should I average it? Um, both great questions. I will take the second one first. I think it depends on what you're trying to answer, meaning if the metric you're, you're using is in, in the case study I showed, for example, it was about dry weather performance and dry weather energy consumption. That's what we we had established as the as the time frame to consider and so that is a very um, utility specific slash plant specific requirement um, as far as is it useful i think it's very useful however it will only be as useful as the data that go into it meaning yes it's a semi quantitative approach because it's based on the theoretical requirements yes very valuable but i think what's more powerful there are you know more than a dozen plants that we know of now that are using this to benchmark where they are it's very in interesting to see where where does one fit in that pl pl a plethora of uh, facilities and you know the more data we gain into this type of a of a framework the better we can improve it improve um the access to information and and so on. So yes, I, I think it's a valuable system. Great. Thanks, Sandy. I do see a couple hands up in the chat. If you do have a question you'd like to have responded to, could you please put that in the Q&A and we will get to it as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, next one in. Does low dose, so your dissolved oxygen operation, have implications on settleability or thickening? Yeah, that's a great, great qu uh, question. Um, in that particular case, st uh, a study, we didn't look at thickening. We did look at SVIs. It did not have an impact on SVI. And actually, there's there are other plants I've worked with in the past where we've done side-by-side -side uh, testing where if there are plant uh, managers uh, uh, listening, of course, be careful. I operated one train for a while. The plant operated another train for a while and we compared um, energy production, um, secondary effluent quality, or in, in that case, it was actually mixed like a, um, uh, nitrogen species and SVIs. And what we found is as long as you have a good selector, have good hydraulics, have good process management, so you're not bouncing up and down from zero to two in your aerobic zones at some you know, uh, uh, ridiculously high frequency, SVIs are very well pr pr uh, protected. Um, I have not done work myself around the dewatering, um, the, the thickening and uh, uh, dewatering impacts, but from what I understand from colleagues who have, uh, there is some, but very limited and manageable uh, impact. Thank you. How does phosphorus removal play into the energy nutrient removal nexus? Yes, another wonderful um, question. So maybe let me start with the with um, with this with this um, important idea that depending on the receiving body, one or other of, of nitrogen or phosphorus will, will be more important. If both are equally important, um, you know, certainly you what you, the underlying thing you need to focus on is how am I using my carbon? 
Um, it will get used in particular areas for the processes which have the highest rates. And so you, you do have to think about your carbon balance and having enough to you know, have both successful nitrogen removal as well as P removal. Uh, just as an aside, we've done a fair bit of this around both um, suspended and granular systems. And if um, folks are interested, you know, they can they can reach out to me or our team or uh, anybody in our local um, offices and they, they can help, you know, connect you with myself or our new uh, wastewater uh, sector leader as well. So we, we, we can help, you know, sp answer very specific carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus balance qu uh, questions because it is plant specific. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, we have time for one more question. And this is a two part one for you, Sandeep. Many yeah. plants do not use the methane produced in anaerobic digestion. When does anaerobic digestion, combined heating and power, make sense? And are there better ways to capture energy from wastewater? Um, uh, Yes, to the latter. I think there are complementary ways. Um, again, not, not to be coy about this. I don't know that they're better or worse. It really depends on the particulars of a facility. Um, as far as when um, it becomes a viable you know, technology or component as part of an integrated resource management program, you know, you really have to think about anaerobic digestion as offering you not just energy production value, but also biosolid stabilization value. So you have to look at both your the overall costs of managing those biosolids and what end use opportunities are afforded to you, coupled with how else can you get, um, how, how else can you use the, the, the methane? There are a number of different ways you, you can think about using the methane, especially now that we have, you know, uh, the potential for RIN, cr RIN credits, among other things, that threshold for where anaerobic digestion and CHV become viable, which conventionally, when I was a bit younger and had some hair, let's say, um, we would think about a 10 MGD line, 10, uh, 10 million gallons per day uh, around... 38 MLD, but I think now we're we're moving that further down to you know smaller systems where it's still a viable and and very functional technology. So that addresses the scale issue. Thank you, Sandy. All right, and with that, we are going to wrap it up today. Thank you, Sandeep, and thank you all for your participation today. If you have any other questions for Zant for Sandeep, his contact info is located in the chat, email and phone number. You will receive an email shortly with your participation certificate, and we will also be posting this presentation on stantech.com if you'd like to listen again or share with a colleague. Our next presentation will be on Thursday, October 17th, where our panel will be talking about the new PFAS maximum contaminant limits. We hope you can join us again soon. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.